Oh boy. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully you can see that. Yep. Yes. Good. Um, okay. I think we're ready to go. Um, first, I'd like to thank Michael and the Southeast Center for Photography for this invitation to speak um, and for everyone for coming out tonight for the talk. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and to make new acquaintances. Building a photographic community is certainly one of the benefits of the internet and especially during COVID. My hope is that this talk will inform and inspire you in your own work. I'd like to give you a little background information that might help you to more fully understand my work. My pri primary residence is uh, in the Midwest in Evanston, Illinois. I raised a family and have a master's in clinical social work. I was in private practice for 30 some years and I've done a significant amount of traveling which has also informed my views on the human condition. I've always used the camera to try to better understand the world around me. It's been a tool. I started taking photographs later in life, in my 40s, after taking a class at a local art center with this incredible teacher, uh, Dick Olderman. He was inspirational and he taught me to see the poetry in photography and also asked uh, a lot of questions about life. So it was poetry and philosophy. I began a da daily journaling practice, which helped crystallize what was most important. Uh oh, can you hear the dog? Are you okay with the barking? Yeah, okay. Um, I began a daily journaling practice, which helped to crystallize what was most important in my life for me, which was how connected I felt to myself or to others and how much separation I felt. Um, so I decided in doing the journaling that that would be the focus of my inquiry. Oh no, why isn't it going? Hold on. Okay. I'd like to start with this painting I came across at the Yale Art Museum by John Balsari, Solving Each Problem as It Arises. It can be a subject matter of a religious nature, a scene in a foreign country, Whatever the subject, the professional artist makes exhaustive studies of it. When he feels that he has interpreted the subject to the extent of his capabilities, he may have a one-man exhibition whose theme is the solution of the problem. It's surprising how few people who view the paintings realize this. In looking more deeply into the issue of separation and connection, I realized that the very first separation in life for each and every one of us is at birth, the moment the umbilical cord is cut. How do we come into existence? How do we enter the world? Is there any conscious memory of when this happens? No matter where we are from or who we are, we all go through the same universal experience. It's just part of being human. One of my earliest images, which I showed at the very first exhibit I had at a coffee shop on Central Street in Evanston, foreshadows the theme of my photographic explorations. I really love the photograph because it references both birth and death in one single image. Um, this was taken in Northern Wisconsin and it was my daughter coming out of the water. In my interest in trying to understand our beginnings, I offered to photograph pregnant women and home births. This photograph was made shortly uh, after my next door neighbor's home birth. And all this exploration led me to this series, which was the first really conceptual body of work I created, which was based on my curiosity and inquiry into connection and separation. The work is titled Before the Butterflies. And these pieces are 40 by 40 and I had to build a uh, developing tray in the basement and it took two of us to develop the work. Is it a chrysalis or body bag or uh, maybe it's both? References both beginnings and endings. What I find really fascinating about this work is, and I took it to PhotoFest years ago, like when I, 
at the very beginning of my career and somebody said, don't you want to put trees in the background? And I just felt like that person totally didn't understand the work. And now when I look back on it, I can see how it explains something to me that I didn't understand at that time consciously, but I do now in terms of kind of where we come from and where we return to. I'd like to share a quote from a book titled, Each Moment is the Universe, Zen and the Way of Being Time by Danon Kataguri. Quote, one aspect of time is to separate and the other is to connect. The aspect of time that separates you from others is the human world. The aspect of time that connects you to others is universal truth. You're connected to all beings in time, which permeates into every inch of, your co of the cosmic universe and space where everyone and everything exists together in peace and harmony. So you are you, but you don't exist alone. You're connected. The black, as I mentioned, the black space in this image refers to my ideas of where we come from and where we return to, ideas which are still forming and feel more important than ever after some significant losses in my life. You can't really appreciate or understand birth and life without coming to terms with death and dying. I've spent years exploring one of the greatest mysteries of life, the final separation. Socrates wrote in the text of The Last Days, and I quote, to be afraid of death is only another form of thinking that one is wise when one is not. Is it not to think that one knows what one does not know? No one knows with regard to death whether it is not really the greatest blessing that can happen to man, but people dread it as though they were certain it was the greatest evil. In our culture, discussing death and dying has been a taboo subject for many years, even though it's the only thing that is a certainty in our lives. I find, found that I needed to seek out places and situations in which I could learn more about death and dying, especially since I had no significant losses in my life up to this point. I had heard about how the Mexican culture celebrated the deceased um, on their day of the dead holiday so I traveled to Oaxaca, Mexico to learn more about it. What I found was an openness, not only to the subject of death, but also celebrations of all who had gone before. The cemeteries were gathering places on the evening of the holiday. Families would place multiple candles on the gravesite, gather, have a special meal and enjoy each other's company. The children would often be playing in and around the gravesites. Every home also creates an altar for their loved ones, placing their favorite foods and drink on the altar along with other treasured items with hopes that the spirits would return for a visit. I also traveled to Varanasi, India, one of the holiest sites in the country on the Ganges River. Most Indians final wish is that of being transported to Varanasi to be cremated and having their ashes released into the river. I spent four days there trying to more fully understand their beliefs and rituals around death and dying. It was a very intense experience and I actually witnessed the funeral pyre consuming the human body. In trying to more fully understand death and dying, I thought a slaughterhouse might be a good place to visit. I called in favors to visit a slaughterhouse in the Chicago area, knowing some chefs in the food industry but to no avail as there were lots of federal regulations. And then I spent a week studying photography with Debbie Fleming Caffrey, a prominent Southern photographer in Louisiana in the mid 1990s. There it was no problem gaining access to a slaughterhouse. I visited one um, where they had pigs and they would kill the pigs with guns. And um, I, I was witness to it all, photographed, the whole thing and um, it was pretty traumatic. I took many photographs and had a fitful night of sleep and threw up the next morning and needless to say I became vegetarian for a bit. <laughs> I learned while I was there that the pig heart is the same size as the human heart which for me was a perfect metaphor and I made a self-portrait. I worked for some time with pig hearts. My models were very tolerant and generous with their willingness to work for me, with me. 
continuing my inquiry, I was lucky to participate in a program titled Chicago in the year 2000, funded by the former Gary Comer of Land's End. Mr. Comer loved Chicago and thought it would be wonderful to have photographers photograph the city for a full year. I was able to work with a hospice group and covered a couple on the north side, Joe and Gloria, who were joined in common law marriage. Joe had advanced Parkinson's disease. This project, along with so many other things I have photographed, was important in my gaining a clearer understanding of death and dying. I do remember feeling the limitations of the subject matter as it seemed to focus more on the physicality of our bodies and less on the spiritual side of our existence. And then one day Gloria pulls out this t-shirt from the bottom drawer that says, I believe I can fly. So she puts it on Joe and I was able to take this photograph. Working with hospice patients took a personal toll on me. I was consumed with death I, rarely, I subsequently gave notice that I needed to wrap up the project and I was coaxed by the director of City 2000 to photograph a day of kite flying on the south side of Chicago, a great counterbalance to what I had been doing. And by the way, I became a hospice volunteer after this project. <clears throat> I also attended autopsies and have participated in the ritual bathing of bodies in preparation for burial. I've sought out any subject matter that might further my understanding of the death and dying process. I'm gonna do a slight detour here, but it's important work about the environment and especially relevant today as we confront the effects of climate change. As I watched the events unfold after 9-11, I decided to sign up for a disaster relief training program with the American Red Cross. I finished the course shortly before Hurricane Katrina hit the south. With my children grown and my love for all things Louisiana, I decided to volunteer with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I was assigned to a mental health team of 16 professionals, and we were stationed in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Uh, the city started a program that was titled Look and Leave, hoping by inviting the residents back to view the remains of their homes they would be comfortable leaving. I had no intention of photographing and had left my Hasselblad film camera behind. I had taken uh, the Rebel digital camera with me and it, I was so overwhelmed with what I was seeing and experiencing and feeling and hearing that I de decided I needed to do more. Um, I needed to tell the story photographically. Every day, I, I actually, then I, I mentioned this to my team leaders. And at that time, um, George Bush was in office and we weren't allowed to talk to any, any um, press people. And when I went to, we would debrief after every um, night. And I mentioned this to my team leader and she said, you know, that I couldn't do it. And several of the African-American team members said, you go for it. So I did. Every morning I would get up really early and photograph around the edges of the enclosed community. I never photographed people, but I was carrying their stories with me. The photography helped me to process the experience and share it with others. I photographed the remains of community with an eye toward any hint of renewal. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's a green blade of grass coming through here. This photograph is a church pew that was sitting outside of the battleground church in the Lower Ninth Ward with the dried mud and green plant offering hope after the devastation of the Lower Ninth community. This work was eventually turned into a book titled by the name of the program, Look and Leave, Photographs and Stories from New Orleans Lower Ninth Ward. I also came back to Chicago and had an exhibit at the Chicago Cultural Center. And I think that was probably my most favorite exhibit that I had because it was, um, you know, many, many people that wouldn't normally see the work had a chance to see it because it was in such a public space versus a gallery. 
This work titled Crude Awakening was created fast and furiously after the deep, deep uh, Horizon BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It was my response to the wildly circulated photograph of the pelican drenched in oil. I was outraged while reading on Facebook about how my fellow photographers in Louisiana were being refused access to cover the spill, and it was my way of adding to the dialogue. These were taken on the shores of Lake Michigan. Michigan? Many years were spent exploring life cycles and all this contributed to the creation of the burn. In 2007, I received an acceptance letter from the Ragdale Foundation in Lake Forest, Illinois to attend an artist residency. Having time at Ragdale was the game changer for me. The property is located on a magnificent prairie. Many of the artists walk the prairie in the res during the residency, which is a wonderful place for contemplation. While I was there in October of 2007, creating work on the skeletal remains of leaves, I was taking a walk and came upon a very small controlled burn. I took a few photographs, picked up some ash and charcoal to take back to my studio and asked if I could follow them the following spring. I mean, who isn't fascinated by fire? That spring, my first grandchild was born, and within weeks, my sister was being diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The cycle of life was very much on my mind. In April, I called the Lake Forest Open Lands. I almost forgot to, but I did call them in April to see when they would be burning, and they were going out that very morning, which happened to coincide with my sister's very first chemotherapy treatment. So it was a very intense time for me. And as I looked through the camera's viewfinder, I kept thinking about the parallels between what I was seeing in the prairie and what was happening in my sister's body as the chemotherapy was an attempt to also clear out the invasive cells to make room for healthy tissue to regenerate. <clears throat> and so began eight years of following the Lake Forest Open Lands Restoration Ecologists. Burns take place in the spring and fall and only under specific weather conditions. This is a transitional time when the boundaries between seasons dissolve and birds begin their migratory flights. Controlling and photographing burns is arduous and potentially dangerous. I try to stay ahead of the smoke, but often because of the angle of the sun or the way the wind is blowing, I need to push myself into it. The smoke can be blinding and the heat is sometimes so overwhelming that I must leave the site for relief. The smell and sensation of the burn permeates everything I carry, clinging to me for days. Controlled burns are used to restore and maintain natural habitat by reducing dead plant material, removing invasive species and enriching the soil. There are certain seeds that actually require the intense heat of fires to germinate. The day this image was taken, I thought it was gonna be my last time photographing the burn and then this picture happened. And I thought maybe the burn's not done with me. Uh, the title of this is Falling Ash and you know, of course I tried to recreate it and I wasn't able to. Hmm. The smoke both conceals and reveals that while flames leap from the earth, the densely layered landscape is enveloped in veils that are alternately transparent, translucent, and opaque. The foreground melts into the background in the quickly changing terrain, altering one sense of scale and space. Reference points and orientation are intentionally obscured. I have no interest in realistically rendering the landscape. 
Rather, I look for visual references of a place that my mind cannot grasp, a place in which the sublime resides, inviting a state of quiet meditation. Photographing the burn throughout my sister's illness gave me a guidepost for helping me understand the nature of all living things. Although burns are violent and destructive by nature, they're also regenerative. Prairies and other natural habitats depend on fire for the procreation of native species. To witness and photograph a controlled burn is to place oneself in the presence of a certain terrible beauty. I attempt to capture the ephemeral moment when life and death are not opposed, but are harmonized as a single process to be embraced as one. I'm sure everyone is aware of the devastating wildfires that are burning in the West. Some people believe that the root cause of the catastrophic catastrophic wildfires we are seeing today is because of man's intervention over the last hundred years. By trying to prevent fires, we create a buildup of dry tinder wood, which is fuel for the fire. We are seeking, seeing wildfires come back with a vengeance and they're becoming more frequent with climate change. Today, the average fire season is 78 days longer than in the 1970s. The annual burned acreage has doubled in the last 30 years and is predicted to double again by mid-century. Um, as you notice, most of the pictures did not have fire in them because I really avoided the uh, violence of the fire. But this picture I took the day after my sister passed, November 19, 2012. And it's, a center, it's in the center of a book that I published with Kerher Verlag in 2013 titled the burn. This work is titled The Circle of Ash. Winds sigh in the bittersweet hour. Fires of crimson red rearrange the landscape into a starless carpet of charred remains. Suspended above clear dark waters, ashes take flight on the wings of possibility. So as I mentioned, I live on the shores of Lake Michigan and I love to swim. And um, I heard, I had this crazy notion in my head about swimming across the lake and I called the Coast Guard and they said that they, they there was just a relay that had happened to raise money for cancer research in Chicago at Rush, Rush Hospital. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty interesting. And you know, that's pretty relevant. I'm gonna sign up for it. Um, and it, and I did, and it happened to be the same summer that my mother died. So I would go out in the morning to try to train, but the problem was, is that I brought a underwater camera with me. So most of my mornings were spent photographing rather than swimming. And, um, so I have, I took lots of photographs from Lake Michigan that summer while I was in the water, treading water, actually. And, you know, swimming in Lake Michigan is one of my happy places, one of my many happy places. So about six years ago, I was on a four hour train ride in France en route to Arles. And I had my iPad with me, which included files from the, both the Burn and Lake Michigan. I also happened to have an app that allowed me to combine images. And I explored working with the app, which was called Union, and realized that there was something more there to explore. And when I returned home, I worked on this concept in earnest. And that's how the Fire and Water series came about.
there's a lot of auditioning that goes into creating an image that works. As you can imagine, most of them don't work. I've spent a few weeks every summer since my mid-20s in northern Wisconsin. A few years ago, we took the rowboat out to an area that my grandmother named, or my, my grandmother, my granddaughter named Fairy Shallows. And it, so that started this whole series where I start. this was after so many years of going up there. I don't know what took me so long, but I started photographing the water lilies underwater with an underwater camera not a fancy one. I go out really early in the morning. And the lake is pretty clear. And that was the start of my love affair with water lilies. Hmm. The following summer, I started thinking about the water lilies as abstractions, paying more attention to their forms. My point of reference were paintings by Miro, Kandansky, and Paul Clay. I started shooting while standing on a paddleboard because it gave me the perspective I needed. It was a little risky, but I was careful with my equipment. The season for water lilies is fleeting, as is the light. I head out at daybreak, camera and paddle in hand, as I skim the surface of the water. The fertile primordial muck at the bottom of the lake gives birth to new life. Water lilies are my equivalents, abstract manifestations of an inner state where the unknowable resides. This is a poem from Mary Oliver titled At the River Clarion. Imagine how the lily, who might also be a part of God, would sing to you if it could sing, if you would pause to hear it. And how are you so certain anyway, anyway that it doesn't sing? Two summers ago, I went out to Fairy Shallows with my eight-year-old grandson. He got off his paddleboard and he pulled up these gorgeous translucent water lilies languishing at the bottom of the lake. And that was the beginning of taking abstract abstractions even further. One never knows where the inspiration will come from. It's all about paying attention and being open to possibility. The inspiration for this body of work was a bouquet of flowers I received as a gift in the spring of 2019. Every day over the course of a week, I arranged the flowers using a series of vases, sometimes adding fruit and photographed them in the um, early morning light in my kitchen. I thought of these images simply as a response to the beauty of the flowers. Of course, responses and associations are rarely simple. As the flowers began to wilt, I was just as compelled by the ranunculus's serpentine droop and the gentle splash of peony petals. Thus, these still lives became a series, and its theme is one that has run throughout almost all my photographic work, even if in different guises, the ephemeral nature of all things. So I, I've used wax on my photographs years ago uh, on some work from Mexico. I love the potential for real-time luminosity. 
sometimes I would layer a duplicated dipped image over the photograph to accentuate the light that was um, in the photograph. I began experimenting wax even further at an artist residency a few years ago, again at Ragdale, and began making vessels using water-filled balloons for the form. So these vessels became the container of my portfolios, which were burned and transformed into ash. There was something deeply satisfying about making this work, deconstructing and creating something new. Again, returning to the idea of the ephemeral nature of all things. I hung the ash filled vessels from a ceiling in an experimental show in 2018 during Photo Nola. I look back at that show and I'm, I'm amused. I'd never done anything like it before. Creating the work was a challenge, but hanging and lighting it was something I had not fully considered. Each step had its own challenges. It was probably about six hours before the show was going to open and my husband and I were running around town trying to fight, find lights. We hadn't really thought it completely through. Live and learn. So I've, I've done some work with cyanotype. Um, and this one has the markings of a player piano roll which I did, I picked one up at an antique store in New Orleans and I've been struggling with it for probably the past five years, trying to create something that um, amplifies the music that it was meant to play visually. <clears throat> this piece was created while I was in an artist residency in Norway I placed stones on the chemically treated paper and then exposed it to sunlight and salt water. So um, I made a lot of these cyanotypes and um, I didn't know what I was doing, but I ended up um, making a piece at Ragdale again. And these are pieces of the player piano roll that have been cut up into squares and then exposed and then collaged. And I had brought back some Japanese paper from Japan, which I really liked. And one thing that was really interesting is one of the residents came into my studio and she said, wait a minute, some of that's upside down. <laughs> I had no idea. So, you know, that was really helpful. Thank God I fixed that, right? Here's a close up. So the words take take the boat to the land of dreams. So in player piano rolls, you go from bottom to top. That's how it plays. So this past spring, while I was in NOLA, I had um, I actually did, I, I was pretty productive exploring these piano player piano rolls again. I was hanging them in windows, photographing the light coming through. And then I started combining them with uh, some of the pictures that I would take on my morning walks of you know, pl plants and trees and things like that. They became a little bit more lyrical. So it was a productive spring for me. I haven't done anything since I've been back in Evanston, but then I just took a picture here. I couldn't do it straight on because the prints are a little glossy. So there was um, refracted light, but you can see some of what I was playing with. And then I ended up on my way home from New Orleans, I drove up north and I stopped in Arkansas at uh, Crystal Bridges Museum, which I absolutely loved. And I spent a lot of time in James Turrell's um, 
sky something installation. It was this big dome that you'd look out to the sky. And then he had two light shows at daybreak and at dusk. And I photographed the light shows a lot. And then I ended up combining one of those shots that I took with the paper piano rolls. And I feel like this image probably comes the closest to what I feel like when I hear music. And if some of you have been following me on Instagram, you know that I, um, about these sushi boxes, um, I spent part of the shelter in place in California with my daughter and I would take walks every morning and I just started collecting things, bring them back. And, and my kids were really cute. They said, just think of this as an artist residency. So I really did. We <laughs> ordered sushi one night and, and, you know, they came in these boxes and they said, they were going to throw them out. And I said, you can't do that. And so then this, and also my son-in-law gave me some paint. It's black paint, black 3.0 paint, which is supposed to be the blackest black possible. And um, anyway, so that's, you know, I just started playing around with that. And I really had a good time with this. I really like sculpture or assemblages. Um, and then when I was in New Orleans, um, I ended up doing, I had some old cyanotypes that I'd done down there a few years ago, and then I combined it with the uh, player piano rolls. I felt like I was learning the blues. Hmm. And that, that was the title of the piano roll that I uh, had used. And then in Japan, I just love how they burn wood. I, I forget the name for it, but um, so I took, I bought a torch and started burning the wood. And also the paper on those three pieces I made out of player piano rolls, I, which was a lot of fun, except that I wrecked my husband's uh, Vitamix. That was the end of that. As some of you may know, my husband passed away peacefully in his sleep a year and a half ago. Needless to say, there's been a dramatic shift in my life. All the work I've been trying to understand and the nature of all living things has been helpful and comforting during this transitional time. My husband spent the last few years of his life tearing up our lawn and putting in a native garden. Perhaps it was his answer to climate change and the chaotic times of our country. Watching him seed our garden in the autumn of his years, well, was poetic. When the dump truck pulled to, up to our front lawn with a truckload of leaf mulch, his answer to my shack was, especially because the following year we were hosting a home wedding, his answer was, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> How does one simple tulip bring so much joy? When Howard was putting in the garden, I was a bit appalled to say the least. He was seven years older than me. And I, I turned to him and I said, and, and part of this was because I had done so much about death and dying. We talked about it a lot. I said, when you're gone, who's gonna take care of this garden? And he just looked at me and smiled. Little did I know that it was gonna be the greatest gift he could have ever given to me. This is a poem by William Stafford called The Way It Is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Gardening has become a full-time endeavor the past few weeks that I've been in Evanston. I'm thoroughly enjoying taking care of the plants and they return the favor by taking care of me. I'm finding the creative challenges of designing and move, a moving target really rewarding on so many levels. And I'll leave you with this photograph I took a few days ago in the, uh, of the arbor with a 
climbing clematis that Howard and I grew for our daughter's wedding two summers ago. Each one of us has a story to tell. What is yours? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. It was gorgeous. Um, anybody have any questions for Jane? Oh my God. I do, Michael. I'd like to ask her a couple of questions. Sure. Let me start my video up here so you can see me. There I am. Okay. Jane, I love your work. I just really discovered uh, your work and thanks to Southeast Center for bringing you on as, as to speak. Um, I, first, I just wanna tell you my story about putting native plants in my yard. The man who delivered the leaf mulch only had a three cubic yard truck. And I didn't know how much that was. <laughs> and he delivered that to my tiny front yard. I had this huge, pile of black mulch in my front yard it was it was mon it was it was huge and it's and it started steaming because yeah. it's heat it's heated there's heat generating in there so my neighbors were very tolerant as i spent the rest of that spring distributing that around my gardens and i had the most fertile gardens after i turned a foot of leaf mulch under that i had giant zinnias the following year they were six feet tall they took over my whole backyard I had lots of butterflies too, so that was good. Yeah, it, it's fabulous. It's really a fabulous uh, thing to do. <laughs> it was it was wonderful. Yes, and a question for you is though, um, you you are a writer. And, and a very oh good writer. no, I'm not. I mean, you you might think I am, but I'm not. But I know I write, but I'm, I don't like writing. I I you know all I can say okay. When I did the burn book, I kept asking people to write essays because I kept hoping they were gonna write what I needed them to say and that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then I had to write the essay and it was the most excruciating thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And I'm not a writer. I don't, I mean, it's just writing is hard. Sometimes stuff falls out if I'm lucky, but okay. <laughs> I'm not a writer. Okay. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you for suggestions on how do you get started? Because I, I feel like my, my photos are very intuitively creative, created, but telling someone about them is the hardest thing in the world. And so I, did, I think did journaling help you or blogging I, I, help you? I, I don't, blogging, the Instagram has helped a lot. You know, I just come up with ideas or thoughts and, um, Sometimes they're worth sharing, sometimes they're not. But I, th I think probably journaling every morning and about what you're, what you're working on and writing about that, and just writing about your day. I think the more internal you go, the stronger the work is, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes the hardest things in our life are the most poignant and important to express which, you know, I think a lot of people probably don't want to go there sometimes. I, it, there's something a little bit fearless about me. I kind of jump, jump off the deep end, like swimming across Lake Michigan. That was like crazy. I was with all Iron Man people like this, and I didn't get put in the water until 2.30 in the morning, and the waves were like five feet, and it was pitch black out. And I'm thinking, what am I doing, you know? So, Yikes. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yes, you are fearless, and uh, thank you for sharing your <laughs> wonderful work. And and um, I noticed that you are going more to a more abstract work. In, in as you you have, do you feel like you've evolved to more abstraction? I yeah, I do, and I don't. That could be just a function of age, you know, just trying to. Not have it be about anything, but have it be about everything. Yes. And I, I don't quite know how to do that, but but it's very attractive to me. You know, I'm I'm drawn to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? 
Well, I was wondering um, if you're familiar with uh, Sally Mann's uh, work, uh, I believe it's called What Remains. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I, when she was when she was doing that work, I was saying, oh, my God, I want to go to that farm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, when I went to my daughter-in-law's to shelter in place, I was photographing all their compost. Mm -hmm. And as it, as, as it sort of every day, finally, they made me put it in the garage. Yeah. But, but it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. And, and she, you know, she's also done a series uh, with her husband, who is uh, a, has adult uh, muscular dystrophy. Are you familiar with that? It's very, very moving. Mm -hmm. he, she, she's pho she photographs his um, deteriorating uh, body. Well, and you know, there, there's a there's a movie, Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is like one of my all time favorite movies, and there's a line in there. That the brave the brave men stay and watch watch it. Yeah. And I think that's really true. I think that's right. You know. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's just uh, she's fascinating. I I think, and so I just was wondering if you had seen her work familiar familiar with oh, her yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> Jane. Uh, your, your work is beautiful and it's evolved quite a bit. I was wondering before you had a camera in hand, how did you express yourself? Uh, well, I was a quilter. Okay. I, I, I worked in, with fabric a lot and then growing up, I just did a lot of crafty stuff. Um, why, why choose uh, photography to, to, I mean, quilting, uh, uh, crafty things, moving into photography, seems a little dry it certainly hasn't turned out that way but uh well i didn't i didn't choose photography okay i took the can i took a course at the um community center because we were going on a trip and i had a new camera ah, okay okay so i mean sort of i fell into it i i really hadn't planned on being a photographer at all but i did feel the limitations of the fabric and being able to express what i needed to express so how long did it take you to figure out that you were going to shoot every day well i mean i went on trips i was in critique groups you know there was a turning point in the dark room where i remember i took a photograph of my daughter walking in the shakespeare garden here and it was very much about the tonal scale and i hadn't really figured that out before Okay. Now it's almost like I feel like it's not about the subject matter; it's about the light. Sure, that's what right. it's called. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? If not, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Oh, we'll great! Now, now I can have my tequila. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Well, yeah, I was very impressed with your work. It's just wonderful. So, and thank and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I appreciate very, it. very, very beautiful. Well, it's a privilege, as you all know. It's such a privilege to be able to share your work, which is I just I'm just going to put a plug in for Instagram as a practice. It is a practice for me. Um, I shoot every day, and then I try to put something up that that's decent. I try not to put up anything that's not good. So, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing a very, I mean, it's an editing thing, but it also keeps me engaged with photography. And I can't think of a better way to be an artist than to be able to continually make work and share it with people. I mean, what is it about anyway? It's about sharing it. So I really encourage people to do that. Jane, I, I love the idea of doing photography every day, and I've tried to do that, but I never thought of Instagram as being the driver of that or as something that would help. Personally, I've never done Instagram. I've been kind of leery of it just because of the security. Once you put your images up there, what the hell? I mean, you're, you're giving them away. What the hell? Don't you want to share them? Isn't that what it's about? I mean, you know, I know people have issues with that, but it was seven or eight or nine years ago, somebody, my nephew said, why aren't you doing Instagram? I said, why would I do it? You're a photographer. 
And then what happened was like when my father was failing in the hospital and my mother was failing, I had to come up with a good picture that day in the hospital. Wow. And, and it was the light coming through the window. And I can't tell you, my Instagram feed is like my diary. It is my life. I know exactly where I was when I took those pictures. And, um, you know, it's more, it's, it's, it's just, you know, there, there is a little self-promotion in there. You know, I put this talk in there, but it really, I, I love looking through it and seeing where I was at that time. I mean, it's, it's a real good record. Is, is Instagram your website? Or do you have a... No, I have a regular website too. What is that? It's my name. Is it uh, Jane Fulton Alt? Yeah. Dot photography or or. Dot com. Okay. Hmm. I have to say, you're an inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. Well, go out and shoot that light. Find the light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Annabelle, I've just, uh, yeah, it's so sweet to see people. Yeah. Thank you for coming out and um, go get creative. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Good. The for next month, we have Meg Griffiths on July 15th. I can't believe it's July already. Mm -hmm. um, August, we have Doug Dubois stopping by. So check back in. And we'll keep this thing going. All right. Thank you all again. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Michael, which show is this that we see hanging behind you? Behind me is the staged photograph that Richard Tushman was the juror for. Very nice. Thank you. Beautiful gallery. Thank you.